So the fast has begun, first day of the fast. All of our stomachs are growling, even those who... Isn't it funny that, you know, sometimes we'll go throughout the day and you won't get to lunch or something until like, I don't know if this happens to anybody else, but it happens to me where I'll wake up, go about my business, and I'm at 2.30, I'm like, oh yeah, food. Um, And some of us, you know, that's kind of our norm, and even this morning we're like, oh, the fast is really getting to me. But, (laughs) But we'll make it, amen? All right, well, speaking of the 21-day fast, you know, I just want to encourage you to, to jump right in um, and engage. If you've never fasted before, uh, the bulletin has some, some great starting points, some tips to get going. Um, you know, Galatians 5.16 says that we're called to walk by the Spirit and not carry out the desires of our flesh. Amen? And sometimes we can go through life, and if we aren't careful... Or if we just kind of, if things are a little bit too merry and bright, let's just say during December, uh, we, we uh, get going on the cookies, we get going on everything. But more than, just, more than just food, sometimes if we don't master over our flesh, the flesh masters over us. Is that right? And that's why the same chapter in Galatians that encourages us to walk by the Spirit, the same chapter that talks about the fruit of the Spirit showing up in our life is the same chapter that says, therefore, crucify the flesh with its passions and desires. We're, we're to walk by the Spirit. And you know what? Fasting is a great way to crucify the flesh. Can I get an amen? It's saying no to ourselves and yes to God. And you know what? Some, you know, my... My wife, we've had, like, kids for the last eight years. So she, during this time of year, she's always usually had a baby or feeding the baby or something, and she can't f- fast to the capacity that she would want to. Or, you know, every, there's always going to be limitations here and there. You've got to do what is, is smart and what is, is good for you. But I can just affirm and tell you fasting is not going to kill you. Even, even something crazy, like a 40-day fast of just water, you won't die. Did you know that? And not just because it's like, it's biblical, but I mean, just Google it. There are, there are lots of people that have done 40-day fasts. Even secular people have done fasts that long. So I'm just, can I attest can I affirm from the pulpit, we will not die if we go without food. Amen? amen? Can I get an amen? amen? So, you know, and the point isn't suffering. The point is to replace that time of food with seeking the Lord, with prayer, with, with, with talking to Him throughout the day, with taking your lunch break to say, hey, you know what, I'm going to get in the Word. I'm going to read my Bible over lunch break. You know, it's a, it's a great thing. And I will tell you, that if you decide to fast, things will happen like you've never seen. Free ice cream, <laughs> invitations to, to like high-end restaurants. Suddenly, that guy who never brings anything, who's the moocher of the office, brings a full spread, you know. But stay strong, saints in the Lord. No, but, I, and, you know, I, I, and the last thing I'll say about fasting is I just want to not only encourage you to do it, but as I see in Scripture, almost every example that I can find that deals with fasting. There's lots of examples in Scripture about abstaining from things. There's lots of examples, but it's not called fasting. Fasting usually always involves food. Because we want that, we need it, we enjoy it, right? So I think, it's, I think it's really good and healthy to turn off the social media or to turn off this or that at the, at, you know, for, a, for a period of time. But I just encourage you, even if it's just one day a week, just do something that involves going without food. Amen?
You know, when Jesus said, put oil on your face, wash your hair and put oil on your face, I don't think that was because they were going without their latte or their checking their Facebook. If, if you have to put oil on your face to hide the despair from checking your Facebook, there's probably different issues going on. <laughs> but, amen? All right. So why do we fast other than to know and grow in our relationship with God? Right? I mean, why do we do it? It's just, we want to grow in our relationship with God. We want to know Him better. So, and that's what we're actually going to be talking about today. And the course of this whole month, we're going to be continuing our series that Pastor Steve started last week. And the series is called Setting the Course. Um, Setting the Course. Uh, We're going to be looking at the vision of our church, of the River Church, and really the heartbeat of our core values in light of the big picture of what God's called us to do. Amen? And I can assure you, this is, this is stuff that every believer is called to do. Amen? This is, not just, this is not just the River Church deal. But this is, a, for the next four weeks, we're going to go through um, really who we are as a church and our core values. You know, when you, there are so many questions that are answered when you decide where you're going ahead of time, right? Has anybody driven cross-country, gone on a road trip or anything like that? Does it benefit you? I mean, some of us guys were like, we'll figure it out, just leave me alone. But does it benefit you to just try to meander around? Or is, it, is there a lot of questions answered if you just type in or you know ahead of time where you're going? Do you ever start a trip not knowing where you're going? Not an efficient one, right? I mean, you might have a nice Sunday joyride in beautiful weather, but if you need to get to a destination, it's best if you decide where you're going ahead of time. Amen? You know, I was, uh, just a quick, quick story. When I was a teenager, when I was in seventh grade, I was at my friend Jordan's house, in my friend John's house, and we were uh, biking, we were racing our bikes in the street. Has anybody ever had a concussion before? (laughs) Um, Nasty things. Nasty things, those concussions. Um, We were were racing our bikes, and I was racing Jordan over here, uh, down the street, actually in front of the Karen's house now, now they live there, and we were going about as fast as I could, we could, because I wanted to beat him on my little BMX mongoose, and um, and we weren't wearing helmets because we we're seventh graders. I was a cool seventh grader, um, and my foot slipped off the pedal and I barrel rolled, and and then I woke up. Um, I actually. I actually woke up, and, I mean, concussions aren't funny, but this was kind of funny, hindsight, um, because I woke up to my friends, um, to Jordan's older brother, uh, joking, they, I was obviously coming too, but he jokingly said, if he's dead, I get his hat, and <laughs> that, was, that is what I regained consciousness to. <laughs> um, so, wear your helmets, kids. Um, and adults. It really, I actually know of, of unfortunate stories like that. But when I, when I woke up, I knew it was Saturday because I had delivered my shopper in, in my neighborhood. I knew it, I was at Jordan and John's house in the neighborhood. And I knew I was hurting pretty badly. And I knew I wanted to go home but I didn't know how to get there. And that's scary. And I mean, I kind of, I mean, I can think it's funny, but, and some of you are thinking, well, that explains a lot, Pastor Tony. Um, (laughs) But I sat on my friend's couch for probably 10, 15 minutes, and I just thought, I'm like, how do I get home? And I couldn't remember. And you know what, that's a, eventually I did remember, and I went straight home, 
I didn't tell my parents, and I went to bed, which is all the wrong things that you're supposed to do. Thank you, Lord, for your kind protection over my life. But um, <clears throat> that is like us going through life and not deciding ahead of time. Sometimes we, you know, Jesus said, in this life you will have trouble, right? He said, but take heart, I have overcome the world. He also said he is the way, the truth, and the life. You know, we're supposed to be following Jesus. As Christians, little Christs, our, our, our MO is to follow Christ. If, we're, if, if we call ourselves Christians, but we're not following Christ, we're doing it wrong, right? And, you know, sometimes we will face circumstances in our lives, and we experience trouble. We experience heartache. We experience hurts and pains. And you know what? We're, we might be sitting there in our life just wanting to go home. Have you ever been in a situation like that? Where maybe not literally, but in your heart, you're just like, I just want home. I just want for things to not be the way they are right now. And if we don't know God, if we don't have a relationship with the Lord, if we haven't decided ahead of time to follow Christ, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Amen? When we don't decide ahead of time, or if we don't even know the Lord at all, a lot of us are stuck in situations like that where we're sitting in our life, we just want to go home, but we don't know how to get there. And that's why we need to know the Lord. That's why we need to have a relationship with Him and follow Him each and every day. That's why daily we need to pick up our cross, deny ourselves, and follow after the Lord. Because we have plans, in our, and we make plans, but the Lord directs our steps. Amen? And even if in our darkest moments... He knows how to lead us the way that we should go. Amen? So deciding ahead of time, I mean, even the fast. If you decide ahead of time that you're fasting today, going to Pizza Ranch after service is not a temptation. Right? I mean, right? <laughs> um, we need to decide ahead of time. We have to set the course ahead of time it helps us keep the main thing the main thing. Right? I've heard it said, if you keep the main thing the main thing, all the secondary things will work themselves out. But if you keep the secondary things the main thing, nothing will work out. Right? And as a church, we want to set our course and go through the vision of, our, of who we are, of what we're doing. And this is nothing new. This is what we're doing. This is who we are as a church. Right? Because um, we want to keep it the main thing. We want to set our compasses, set the course, so when we get off track or we get frustrated, if, we, if we're wondering what's next, we can just look back and be like, oh, this is where we're going. This is what we're doing. Amen? So the main thing, the, the vision at the River Church is that the River Church is a place to know and love God and to grow and love people. It's to know and love God and to grow and love people and everything that the Scripture commands in, in, within that. Amen? That's what we want to be about. That's the course that we want to set. That's the race we want to run for the glory of God. Amen? We want to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ with the world, with our neighbor, with our families, and we want to grow as we do it. Amen? So today we're going to start with the first one. That is to know God. And we are going to be in John chapter 4. John chapter 4. I wasn't going to pick a long passage to read from, but Jesus' interaction with the Samaritan woman at the well was too perfect for our subject today, so we're going to 
we're going to go through it. John chapter 4, we're going to start in verse 7, and we're going to read through verse 26. So bear with me. It's on the screen. If you have your Bibles, I just encourage you to bring your Bibles. If you have your Bibles, John, it's the fourth gospel. John chapter 4, verse 7. It's on the screen. It says, Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, If you only knew the gift of God, the gift God has for you, and, you, uh, and who you are speaking to, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get the living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave, this, uh, who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I will give them will never thirst again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I will never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right, you don't have a husband. For you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You, currently spoke the, you certainly spoke the truth. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. <laughs> so, tell me why it is, uh, so tell me why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship while we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim? where our ancestors worship. Jesus replied, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation's come, salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, indeed it is here, now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, The Father is looking for those who will worship Him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When He comes, He will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. For the one who you speak to is He. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you would help us to know you. God, that we would worship you in spirit and in truth. Holy Spirit, we just acknowledge your presence and we invite you to move on our hearts and to speak to us this morning. We're so grateful for your faithfulness, God. Lord, every single morning, Your mercies are new. And Father, we come to you humbly. Lord, I ask that you would open our ears and open the uh, eyes and ears of our hearts to see and hear what you have to speak and show us today. Lord, we want to know you more. We want to be changed by you. We want to walk differently because of our relationship with you. God, help us to know you biblically. Help us to know you relationally. And help us to know you eternally. God, we love you, and I just ask that you would anoint my words this morning to to share your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So how do we know God? As we go through our walk with Christ... That's something that we want at the river to help every single person grow in, to know God. And what do we mean by that? The first thing we mean by that is to know him biblically. We want to know 
who God is biblically. And I know that seems like a, like a no-brainer, or I hope that seems like a no-brainer, right? But in our culture of just subjective, subjective reasoning and really a relativistic truth, a lot of people want to make a cocktail of who God is. And that's just not how it works. God's given us his word to reveal his character and his nature. You know, we've talked uh, several weeks ago, we, we talked about how the word of God is like a puzzle. It's all these little pieces. And when you get them together, you see a picture of who God is. You know, the, wor- the word isn't God. But in John chapter 1, the word became flesh and he's Emmanuel. Amen? And if we look at this passage, verse 24, it says, For God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. You know, truth, the, these, this is how we approach God. We need to approach him in spirit. We're born by the spirit. Jo, uh, John chapter 3, when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, we're born again by the spirit. It's the work of God in our lives. But we also have to know God in truth. Amen? You know, if you, if you are in a relationship, it would behoove you to know what your spouse or the other per, or your friend or whoever you're in this relationship with is like, right? It would benefit you to know their likes, their dislikes, and it would be embarrassing if you assumed things or ascribed things to them that were just couldn't be farther from the truth, right? If someone wanted to brag about me being a basketball player, I would kindly remind them that I can't even finish a game of horse. So that would not be interacting in a truthful way if someone said they know me really well and that I'm a star basketball player, right? It doesn't make sense. Amen. Hold your applause. Um, But sometimes, sometimes... Well, let's just get into the text. Jesus is talking to this lady, and she gives him, Jesus says two things that are very telling about which, who she thinks he is. In verse 10 and verse 22. In verse 10, it says, Jesus replied, If you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. Does she know who Jesus is? No. 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 In verse 22, you Samaritans know very little about the one you worship. Do you think that's a compliment? Do you think if we had a guest speaker here next Sunday and they said, you River Church people know very little about the one you worship, would that be a compliment? (laughs) No. In Jesus' name, it's not going to happen. But she didn't know who she was talking to, and she had a very limited understanding of who she worshipped. Jesus is telling her that if we're going to worship God, it has to be in spirit and in truth. We need to know who we are worshipping. Amen? How do we know who we are worshipping? Do you guys, have you, have you heard of George Washington? Do you know who he is? We got one honest person here. We, you know, I, we know who George Washington is. He's the first president of the United States. And there's a lot, he's a general. And, you know, we could go down the list and list the things that we generally know about him. But does anybody actually know him? So let's, we need to know who we're worshiping. We need to know God. And we need to know, know him biblically. What's interesting is that the Samaritans only recognized the first five books of Scripture, the Pentateuch, the first five books. So all the, the, the prophets and the, the poetry, like Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, uh, Joshua, Judges, um, I mean, you, the First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, all the, the historical records. I mean, you look at the entirety of the Old Testament, and the Samaritans only recognized the first five books of the Bible as Scripture. They only thought that was valid. So 
what you see here is someone with a very limited understanding, an incomplete picture of the full biblical picture of who God is, right? The Samaritan woman was missing the full picture of who God is, and the same thing can happen to us if we're not careful. When was the last time we read Amos? <laughs> Don't raise your hand. Um, what about Habakkuk? How many guys knew if Habakkuk was even in the book? Just don't raise your hand. Um, I'm just kidding. But, you know, we're supposed to, if we're supposed to worship God in truth, he's chosen to reveal himself through Scripture, right? And it's a privilege, you know, it's a privilege that we have the Word of God. You know, you, we have, there's so many English translations. If English isn't your first language, there's probably your first language translation of Scripture. You know who didn't have the Scripture? The disciples. Paul, he wrote it. Many of, much of it in the New Testament. I mean, these disciples were preaching Jesus from the Old Testament. And some of us avoid the Old Testament like the plague because we heard Jesus said, I've fulfilled it. And it's like, hello, what, do you, what Bible do you think the apostles were preaching from? Right? You know, if we have a limited understanding of Scripture, we'll have a limited understanding of God. And that's kind of the bad news. The good news is we have the Scripture. God has pre preserved His Word for us to know Him. Really, the God, creator of heaven and earth, Colossians chapter 1, who made all things, who sustains all things, and who holds everything together by his good pleasure, we get to know him. And he reveals himself in his word. You know, if we cherry pick, even with good intentions, we will not have a full picture of who God is. And when we let the Word of God reveal who He is in its entirety, we get the most beautiful mosaic of who the King of Glory is. Amen? I mean, that, that, that uh, video that we watched this morning, the true and better, if you read Genesis to Revelation, you know, let's just talk about the New Testament. The, much of the New Testament, you think of Paul's letters, Ephesians, Galatians, Colossians, Philippians. Those, some of us will sit down and we'll be making our coffee. And I mean this to say this is what I do. I'm not saying you do this, but this is what I do. We'll be making our coffee and we'll sit down and we'll read, you know, let's say Galatians chapter 1. There's six chapters in Galatians. We'll read Galatians chapter 1, and then our coffee's done, so we'll get up. And by that time, our kids are coming downstairs, so we have to, you know, get our kids breakfast. And by that time, our, you know, our wife is coming downstairs, so we have to help, help get the kids ready with the wife. And by that time, we have to get ready to go to work. And so then we get ready to go to work. And by that time, we just read half of Galatians chapter 1. Did you know that when a letter would come to the city, they would read the whole thing? It was a sermon. They wouldn't read just one chapter. They would read the whole thing. So you got the whole message in its context. And I'm not saying you have to sit down and read the whole Bible front to back, but there is such a richness when we read a lot of Scripture. You know, if we can binge Netflix, why don't we as believers binge the Bible? Try it. Try it. And you know what, guys? Let's have fun with this because I know we're all a work in progress and I know we all struggle with this because, well, when I say I know we all, I know I struggle with this. You know? My daughter can read just by inhaling. She just, and the book is done. And I'm on the second sentence of the first chapter. I'm a really slow reader. And so for me, I just have to, slog through it sometimes, especially when you're talking about, I mean, you're reading the number accounts in numbers. It's like, this is a lot of numbers for several chapters. 
But you know what? It's the Word of God. And when you get the big picture, you see that Jesus really is the true and better. You start to see as you get the whole picture of Scripture in your heart and you see who God decides to reveal himself as biblically, all of a sudden you see, wait a second, the ark is kind of like Jesus. He, he, he asked those, who, there was judgment coming and everybody who was in the ark was saved. That's like Jesus. Isn't it amazing? It's like you over and over you see all these things, and, and wait a second, Joshua is kind of like Jesus, where there's a promised land to be taken. Wait a second, Moses and the deliverance, that's kind of like the cross, how sin and Egypt has been defeated. Wait a second, parting the Red Sea, that's kind of like baptism. And you, all, you go through Scripture, and time after time after time, you're like, wow, God, you are so good. You're so good. It's so rich. I mean, we need to know the word. 2 Timothy 3.15. This is Paul writing to Timothy. You have been taught, this is Timothy has been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ. We can be saved through knowing Scripture. Not academically, because Scripture points to a who, right? Scripture leads us to Jesus because Jesus is the Word made flesh. John 1.14, it, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And speaking of truth, with, you know, you think about the Word, it's called the Word of Truth. Over and over and over and over. You know what? Jesus is the Word and He's the truth. John 14, 6. I don't even know if it's up there. It is. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is not only the Word made flesh, but He is the truth. He's the truth. And if we're going to know God and worship Him in spirit and in truth, it involves knowing Him biblically. Amen? We have to know the Bible. And let me rephrase that. We get to know the Bible. We get to read the Bible. We get to hear of God's faithfulness and see of His rich love that He has for us. You know, Scripture teaches us of who God is. You Put up 2 Timothy 3.16.17. It says all Scripture is inspired. Every, say all Scripture. Everything is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, which is rebuking, correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God or woman may be adequate, which is complete, equipped for every good work. You know, when we read the Word, our goal is to know God. And that's why it's a core, that's why at the river, our core value, one of our core values is that you would know Scripture. Because God has given us His Word so we can know Him. I know I'm repeating myself a lot, but this is, I mean, this is the main deal. This is the main thing, right? This is keeping the main thing the main thing. When we, when we have a vibrant intake of Scripture, all of a sudden we're being taught we're being rebuked. Have you ever been going down the wrong path? Have you ever been doing the wrong thing and you need to stop and turn it around? That's rebuke. I've heard it put like this, between rebuke and correction, reproof and correction. Rebuke is when you're going the wrong way. You need to turn around. What you're doing is wrong. That is rebuke. Correction is driving. It's veering a little bit this way and correcting. It's veering a little bit that way and correcting. The Word of God helps us with all this stuff. I mean, if you have lack of self-control, lack of discipline, if you're just a lazy person, read Proverbs. Proverbs has tons of teaching, rebuke, and correction that we would be wise. 
God loves us, and He wants us fully equipped for every good work. Amen? You know, we get, when we get off a little bit, we see in the Word, it's like, oh, man, I really should. I, that was a big deal. I made it a big deal. I really just need to forgive that person. Correcting. Training in righteousness. God sets the standard of righteousness. And you know what? Let me tell you, our culture is getting pretty, pretty secular, pretty wicked. There's really no, no dressing that up. But the temptation in the church, you know, the church should be, we should be relevant, amen? We need to be relevant to the society. And what I mean by that is, have you tried to read, a, a, what is it, 1511, 1611 King James? Some of you might read the, uh, an old school King James, but I'm talking like the old school King James. People don't talk like that anymore. And it's so with a different translation, or even the New King James, let's keep it in King James. New King James, same message in a relevant way, right? So we need to be relevant to our culture, but we're not going to cater to the culture. Amen? And the temptation is that the church should look just like the world so the world will want to come to the church. And all that does is lower the standard to the point where the world obviously sees that we have no standards at all. So if we want to be salt and light, if we want to love our neighbor well, we have to know that, th that God decides what is righteousness. Right? And someone with standards, even standards that you might disagree with, is a lot more respectable than a spineless person that just morphs to every circumstance. Amen? So let's have a backbone for Jesus. Amen? Let's preach the word. Let's shine the light of Christ to our culture. And you know what? When we get off, even, you know, we're to speak the truth in love to one another. And, you know, the body of Christ is a part of how we grow in Christ and know God is that we get to speak to each other and we get to speak into each other's lives. God didn't make us an island unto ourselves. You know, it's not just you and the Holy Spirit. That's not church. Right? I mean... It's not inappropriate, but it's not God's design in its entirety. So, let's keep going. Scripture teaches us who God is. The more we know the Word, the more we understand who He is. That God is faithful. Do you know He's faithful? That He's loving. In fact, He is love. Again, He's the standard. He doesn't just exhibit it. He is love. God is holy. He's righteous. He's just. And listen, God punishes sin. And He forgives sin. You know, we don't want to have an incomplete picture of what, who God is because of what we've, what we've read, right? We want to know the full gospel. We want to know who God is according to Scripture. We need to know Him biblically. Amen? Second thing is how do we know the Lord? We want to know Him relationally. It says the woman was surprised for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? We want to know God relationally. Jesus met this woman in her circumstances. Do you realize that? Although Jews didn't associate with Samaritans, especially men with women, Jesus, it didn't stop Jesus from having a conversation with her. Although she didn't fully get it, Jesus didn't treat her poorly but explain to her what she didn't understand. Right? And this is much like us. Have you ever been in a situation 
where you needed God to meet you in your circumstances. Maybe this morning. And have you ever been in a situation where you, the king of glory, God, is, is speaking to you, whether through the word or in prayer or through somebody else who loves you, and you just don't get it? And he doesn't belittle you or condemn you, but he patiently reveals himself to you and explains the truth. It says the Spirit of God guides us into all truth. He doesn't say that we're stupid for not getting it. Right? He, he leads us. And you know what? When we don't get it, Psalm 23, I love the, the, how it says, He makes us lie down. <laughs> Sometimes you just need the Lord to make you lie down. And he, where we wouldn't on our own. But, you know, God is a relational God who has chosen to make a covenant with His people. And you know, the scripture is so, it's so amazing because he even says, I am not ashamed to be called your God. Sometimes we blow it, right? We, are, we don't follow Christ the way we should. We don't, we don't obey the word like we should. <clears throat> we blow it sometimes. And yet, God says, I'm not ashamed to be called your God. Because he's faithful to forgive us of our transgressions and to cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness. And it's not a wishy-washy thing. He paid for it with his blood. And yet, he extends his grace, his mercy, and his forgiveness to us anyways. Isn't that amazing? We need to know God biblically, but we have to know Him relationally. The what doesn't make much sense without the who. Right? One of my favorite verses, it, um, really, it's like, I don't know, is it cheesy to have a life verse? I have a life verse. It's uh, Jeremiah 9, 24. And actually, verse 23. September 24th is my birthday, so it's like perfect. Um, but it says, it says, Thus says the Lord, Let not a wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not a mighty man boast in his might. Let not a rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts, boast of this, that he understands and knows me. That I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth. For I delight in these things, declares the Lord. Do we know what God delights in? Do we have a heart like David do, diz, does? Di, 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 di? Uh, do we have a heart like David did in the Psalms where he said, God, help me love what you love and hate what you hate? You know, God hates wickedness. He hates it because it messes with his children. It messes with his creation. We need to understand God. We need to know about him. We need to know the truth of who God is. We need to understand him biblically. If we don't have a biblical perspective of God, we have no perspective of God. We have idolatry. We have what we've made up. So we need to understand God, but we need to know him. We need to know him. This word, know and what we've been talking about this morning, it's an experiential relationship. It's an experiential knowledge. This is understanding. This is facts and figures. This is relationship. Amen? We want to understand the Lord, and we want to know Him relationally. We want to know what He delights in. We want to love what He loves and hate what He hates. You know, Jesus came to be involved in the lives of his people. Jesus didn't come 
in manual. <laughs> Did you get it? I made that up myself. <laughs> Jesus didn't come in manual only. If I know we've said it just because, you know, forgive us, but we've said, like, this is a manual for life. W- forgive us for saying that. It's, you know our intentions, but this is not a manual. I've probably, I've said that. It's not a manual. It's, it is a love letter from a who. Okay? And it's laws and decrees. It's a covenant. It's saying, listen, these are our vows. This is who we are going to be. This is who I am, and this is who you can be in me. Amen? Jesus came as Emmanuel, God with us. Not, he didn't give us a manual to say, figure it out. That's deism. That's, that's, that's like the God is far away. That's like the force. That's heresy. If you think that about God, you're missing the Father who loves you. You're missing the Father who loves you and, and cares enough about you to correct you and cares enough about you to nurse you back to health. Psalm 42 talks about how a bruised reed he will not break and a dim-lit ember he will not extinguish. God is so faithful and tender with us when we're tender. And you know what? When we're stiff-necked, he kind of puts the heat on. Because he's a father. What father doesn't want to raise his children in a loving way that's going to help them? If you have a stubborn, obstinate child... It would behoove you to help that not be so. (laughs) You can read about that in Proverbs. But if your child has a crushed spirit, you know, Proverbs says that hope deferred makes the heart sick. Have any of you been sick in this room before? There's a Father in heaven who knows, I'm talking exactly, exactly how to minister to you right now. He loves us. He's acquainted with all of our griefs. He knows everything that we face. And yet he did it without sin. And he conquered it all so that we could have victory and a new life, a new creation life in him. Amen? He doesn't just make wrong, thing right, wrong things right. He makes dead things alive. He makes old things new. We need to know him relationally. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Guys, we need to know that he loves us, that he's a relational God. And, you know, John 14, 26, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to be our helper. The helper, the Holy Spirit, who the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Jesus said it's better that he goes because as he goes and ascends to heaven in his body, which is one place in Jerusalem. He sent the Holy Spirit to make his home in our hearts where the Spirit of Christ makes his people his temple. And we have a helper who will teach us. You know, uh, Isaiah 42 talks about how God will take us by the hand. He'll take us by the hand. When you don't know what to do, 
when you don't know where to go, we serve a God who is willing to take us by the hand and lead us. Amen? But how are we going to know that unless we dive into the Word? All these promises are in Scripture. We need to know Him. We need to know Him. Jesus got up in the mess of this Samaritan's woman, Samaritan woman's life. I mean, you look at when he asks her, don't you think it's interesting that they're talking about living water and eternal life, and Jesus says, go get your husband. It's like, hey oh, we're not talking about that. That's none of your business. And she says, I don't have a husband. I'm trying to be incognito and he says you're right you don't have a husband because you have five husbands and the guy you're with now you aren't even married to and I think this is so funny because she goes sir I perceive you're a prophet (laughs) it's like yeah you think (laughs) but what's the point of that the point of that is that sounds like a messy situation whether it's through tragedy or immorality, this lady's backstory is messed up, right? And Jesus is not afraid to just sidetrack the entire conversation. We're not even talking about that, Jesus. It's none of your business if I have a husband or not. It's like, well, it is his business because he created you. Because he designed you to be whole made complete in Him. Right? Jesus is not afraid to get in the mess of our lives because He's a relational God. And sometimes we want to talk about one thing. We want to go this way. And we want to ignore all of our baggage. And Jesus is saying, hey, what about this stuff? And we say, don't worry about that stuff. He's like, no, I paid for this stuff. It's my stuff. Amen? Scripture tells us that we can cast our cares on Him because He cares for us. Listen, it's messy. It's uncomfortable. But your baggage is Christ's business. And that's why, you know, we say sometimes when we give the offering, I I said this two weeks ago, I said the same thing. So God doesn't want your money, he wants your heart. That's true. And he wants your money. He wants your life. He wants your baggage. He wants your nice. He wants your ugly. God paid for you. Right? And when we withhold that, it's like the Samaritan woman going, well, well, that's, let me just change the subject. Even after he reveals that, she changes the subject. He just read her mail. And she goes, well, we worship on this mountain. What mountain do you worship on? It's like, what are you talking about? We're not talking about where we worship. And Jesus even goes so far and says, listen, soon it's not even going to matter where you worship. It doesn't matter. What is a church without the people? What is a home without the family? What is a temple without God? You know, what is heaven without the Lord? It's not going to matter because he's going to make his temple in our hearts. And that's why, you know, the third point, the reason we need to know God is because we will know him eternally. Do you know him? But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him He shall never thirst, but the water that I give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. There's eternal life in Jesus. John 17, 3 says, this is eternal life, that we would know him, that we may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life is knowing God. Like I said, what is a home without a family? What is a church without people? What is heaven without God? We're not going just to a place, which we are. We're going to a who? We're going to Jesus. We're going to be with him forever. Do you know him? You know, this isn't Valley Fair. 
You don't just pay your ticket at the door and get to ride any ride you want because it doesn't matter. You're just in the gates. I got in the gates. What are the gates other than the gates that surround God's heavenly domain where he dwells? Right? I know I'm saying the same thing over and over. But listen, Psalms say in his presence there is fullness of joy. At his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. And there are really gnarly looking animals and stuff. It's cool. But we live unto Christ. To die is Christ. To live is gain. Maybe it's backwards. Philippians. 1 Corinthians 8, 3. If anyone loves God, he is known by him. The beautiful thing is, is when we know God and we honor him. We, you know, we're going to be talking about next week about loving God, really worshiping God, what it, what it means to love him, heart, soul, mind, and strength. When you know him, you cannot help but worship him. Romans 12 makes it really clear that it, that's just our reasonable response. <laughs> it's just appropriate that we would not just worship Him, but that we would offer our whole lives to Him. That we would surrender everything and put our, our lives, our bodies, our, our well-being, our future, all of my plans, hope, ambitions are on the altar of God because His plans are better than my plans. Because His care for me is better than I could ever care for myself. Because His faithfulness never fails. And anyone who loves God doesn't just know Him, but is known by Him. Amen? Let me read this last verse and then we'll close. 2 Corinthians 4, 17-18. You know, life is not always hard. Sometimes, I mean, oftentimes, most times, thankfully, life is pretty great. And that scale goes back and forth. But even the best time doesn't compare to what is waiting for us in the presence of the Lord. It says, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. We get to know God eternally. But it starts with knowing Him biblically. It starts with knowing Him relationally. And like the woman at the well, it starts with letting Jesus get into the ins and outs of our lives, the baggage, and all kinds of everything in between. God wants our whole lives. And our whole lives, He's deserving of. Amen? Our highest goal, our highest aspiration is to know Him. Amen? Let's stand and pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to thank you that you're not ashamed to be, all, be called our God. Lord, on our best day or our darkest hour, you remain faithful. Father, I ask that you would meet us right where we're at, each person within the sound of my voice, Lord. 
God, we surrender to you afresh and anew today. Father, I pray that you would help us to know you biblically. God, give us a hunger and a thirst for your word like we've never experienced before. God, I ask that it would be a, it would be a gift of the Holy Spirit, Lord, that I just pray for anybody who has trouble reading, trouble with their schedule. Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would, you would teach them the way that they should go. God, open our eyes to hindrances and, and barriers that are keeping us from engaging in your word. Lord, and I pray that if it's the nitpicking of the enemy, Lord, I just re- we just rebuke that in the name of Jesus. Lord, I ask for a hunger and a thirst for Scripture like you, it's never happened before. Lord, I pray that it would be by your Spirit that you would give us an insatiable desire, especially as we start this 21-day fast, Lord God, that as our hunger for food increases, Lord, that you would increase the hunger for your word, Lord, and your presence. God, that we would go to you in prayer, that we would open your word, that we would go to you and see what you have to say, to see who you really are, God. Thank you, Father, that you've given us your word, that you've revealed yourself to us through Scripture. Father, we thank you for this precious gift of God that's for us. Lord, help us to see who is speaking to us. Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes to the fact that you're a relational God. Lord, and I just pray for anybody who has seen you as a harsh taskmaster that's ready to just bop us on the head or to spiral us into judgment, Lord. God, I just thank you that your blood speaks a better word over our lives. Father, we thank you for the cross. Lord, we thank you that your crimson blood washes us white as snow. Lord, that though our sin was, was as red as scarlet, you make us white as wool. Lord, Father, we thank you for the cross. We thank you for the price that you paid for us, Jesus. We thank you for how you laid down your life, Lord. It was for the joy set before you that you despised its shame. Lord, you did it for us, Lord, for your glory, Lord. And I pray that you would help us to enter into that, God. Lord, if we don't know you, Father, I pray that we would repent and believe. God, that we would follow you all the days of our lives, that we would deny ourselves, that we would pick up our cross and we would follow after you. Lord, I thank you that you're not afraid of our mess, but you lead us out of it. Father, thank you that you are the perfect and righteous standard. And you don't make any concessions. But Lord, you call us to rise up and you make us brand new. You hide us in you. You hide us in your victory. You hide us in your righteousness. Lord, help us to know you and help us to share you with others. In your name we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week.